Zach, it's nice to talk to you finally. We were just saying as he popped into the conversation, it's like, I already know you. And it's that's the funny thing about podcasting is I often podcast with people that I follow on social media and see all the time, but I've never actually spoken to them. But then when they pop up to podcast with me, I'm just like, oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? Like, it's you again. Like, this is so common. So thank you for coming on. Thank you. I, I've been looking forward to it. I think, I think we connected back in February. I've been looking forward to this for a while now. Mm -hmm. the, okay, the first, obviously, usually I have moms on the podcast because it's the mom room podcast. I love when I have dads come on. Um, but to start, I thought you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. So how old is your daughter? Um, where do you guys live? Are you in the US? I, I don't really know much about you. Yep, I'm in Massachusetts, about an hour, hour and a half west of Boston. Um, we just moved into a new house a couple weeks ago, three acres. We're looking to add, we just added goats a couple weeks ago. We're looking to add chickens soon. Oh my God. Yeah. What? Because having a child isn't enough. You're like, I, I should have some goats and chickens. Um, yeah. So, and we have, um, we have, I think she just hit 20 months old a couple of days ago. Um, so a little over a year and a half, she's babbling a lot she can say single words um she's running amok uh every day is is quite the challenge keeping the house reasonably clean um and another fun fact uh when we bought when we were going to buy the house i said to Alyssa, uh, i i don't have a need to move but she really wanted to move um, I was like, I just want an office with a window. And mm. I am now sitting in an office with a window. Yeah. We're looking for a house right now because we're moving about an hour west of where we are. And that's my thing, too. I'm like, I need an office with a window. Like, I, I don't know why. That's that's like one of our non-negotiables because I work from home. I'm assuming you work from home also. Yeah, so it is. It's an important thing to have. So now you have your office with a window. Mm -hmm. One question that I ask all the moms that come on the podcast is, what was your transition into motherhood like? And I've never asked a dad that question. So what was your transition to fatherhood like? Were you expecting the chaos that is being a parent? Were you surprised by anything? Um like, what do you remember, uh, like, about those, like, first few weeks when after she was born? I think you understand the chaos of a child like you understand how to ride a bike before you get on a bike. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you understand informationally that you're not going to have a whole lot of sleep and that there's going to be a lot of stress and that there's going to be a lot that you go through emotionally. But it's just, it's obviously totally different. Like, I remember... The Mother's Day, I think she was she was like 30 months pregnant during the Mother's Day. And she's like, oh, I get to celebrate Mother's Day, right? I'm a mother. And like, it wasn't until the following Mother's Day, she's like, okay, now I get it. Now I'm actually in like the mom's club and I can appreciate like a totally different level of what mothering is compared to being pregnant. Um, and I think so, honestly, the I started making TikToks at the beginning of 2021 it wasn't until I started making content about being a dad, being exhausted, um, and sharing some things that I was doing probably a little bit differently than than most men out there um, that got me a lot of attention on TikTok initially. Um, I was grateful that I got, um, I was working at a place, I was a teacher, um, and I was able to take four, three months of paternity leave, and I manifested a fourth. Wow. And so in that time, in the first two months, she would not sleep in a crib. She would only sleep in your lap. Um, so I would get really lonely. I would get like a little bit sad. So I did a lot of live streaming on TikTok. And that was my 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift of her sleeping in my lap, trying to help Alyssa get sleep in the other room. Uh, so she'd get so when she was touched out and when she was trying to breastfeed, um, and that was, that, that was one of the first, like that I made that video. It's like, it's at 5 million or something right now talking about how grateful and 
proud of Alyssa and all the, the mothers out there for the sacrifices that you all make to try to give your baby everything that you can. Do you think about, so in Canada, most women take a 12 to 18 month maternity leave. And I know it's not like that in the US. Some people don't have any kind of leave and especially a paternity leave. I feel like that's not very common in the US, right? Yeah, I I think from most of the people that I've heard of, um, to get like a couple weeks, maybe through like four weeks is probably above average. I don't know the actual statistics on it. But um, I don't know anyone that's taken as much as I have. Yeah. Um, when I say I manifested a fourth month, that was the the Friday before I was about to go back to work. I got um, appendicitis and had emergency surgery the next day. Um, so then I got another month of like leave for medical leave. Oh my pretty, gosh. I'd been saying for months, I was like, I'm going to have four months of paternity leave. I don't know how it's going to happen because I only actually get three <laughs> and I manifested it in my you, appendix. You manifested your appendix. I love that. So was Alyssa on a maternity leave? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she took, I think, five months. Okay. All right. And so now is your daughter in childcare at all? She was supposed to start Monday and uh, naturally got sick a couple of days prior. Uh, she's about to do three days a week. We think Friday might be her new first day. Okay, perfect. Are you looking forward to that? Are you guys a little bit anxious about that? Or I'm definitely excited about it. Um, I think so. Part of I, another thing that I think I did differently, I, I know we talk a lot about equality and and how so many women's careers change due to the baby coming. And I was a teacher before and about two months after paternity leave ended and I was out of the house for 50 hours, I was like, I don't know how we're going to function as a family because she was going back to her remote work. Um, she's extremely efficient at her job and is able to do it in like two, three hours a day, even though she's taking on like two or three, two or three people's worth of work. Um, but I think there's a huge amount of guilt that I was experiencing um, and it felt like a good, since I was getting attention on TikTok, I was like, well, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I have no sales skills. Maybe this is the time that I switch my career as well. I got my fellow teaching that is, uh, not super respectable. It was a pretty challenging job I was at. Um, so I switched over to a hybrid remote, um, sales. I was making hundred plus cold calls a day. The reason I'm prefacing this is. I sucked at that the first four months, got pretty good at it. I just got promoted in January and now I suck at it being an account executive and account manager now. Um, And so I'm excited because I'm in that early stage of the job where every day I don't feel like I'm doing enough. I'm not for, I'm not closing enough business. Um, And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that part where I can hunker down and have eight plus hours a day to work on that during the, week. Um, and right now it doesn't, it, it's hard for me to feel like I can give myself permission to do that right now. Yeah, no, for sure. Your early TikToks that you were talking about that gained a lot of attention. What was your topic area? Like you said, you were, I think you were showcasing like things that you were doing as a new dad that maybe wasn't common and so people obviously took to it like what kinds of things were you talking about and what was the response from people in the comments oh it's interesting that the first video I was referencing I um I've coined that a a style of video I call a Karen catcher so I call it that because it was a 60 second video um I said I, when I was making it, it was not purposeful, but I realized what happened was the first like 15 seconds of it sound really bad. So I was saying, I was talking about like how I was trying to get my wife 90, 90 minutes of sleep at a time. Um, and then she'd, then she'd wake up and pump more and then give me some more, go back to sleep. Um, and for some reason, a couple hundred thousand or but a lot of people were mistaken in what I was saying 
they thought that we weren't feeding our baby for like eight hours at a time because I was saying it was a 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift. So it was a mixture between some of my other friends were like, can people not conceive that the dad can be with a newborn for that long? Interesting. Um, yeah. That was one thought. And two is just like maybe the first couple phrases of like that 7 to 3 a.m. shift and her getting 90 minutes of sleep on the side. People seem to not think she was getting fed. So there are thousands of com I think there's about 10,000 comments on there. Maybe one or 200 of them are just set, saying, feed that baby. Um, and I will say it was definitely, it was the first time I ever did this was having Everly crying in that video. So it's the mixture of probably a lot of those triggering mom emotions that, that moms experience that were a perfect storm of um, misunderstanding and yeah. upset. Um, but yeah, it, that video, uh, one of the other ones was, they talk about the five S's of soothing. And I shared what I thought was the six S, which was mom's shirt, um, because I had a hard time soothing her. And I realized when I introduced her shirt and her smell, um, that was a, a pretty big game changer in being able to um, manage her in the first weeks. Um, and I And I think I made a pretty similar video to that, again, where she was crying and I showed over a three minute, I think the whole real raw footage was probably like 10 minutes it took me to calm her down but i showed how i used her t-shirt within like a long three minute video to calm her down um and sort of trying to get my my dad reps in to to learn how to manage our, our newborn i always think like there's a few creators like you who are dads who you consume a lot of content from mom creators that talk about difficult things in parenting, like being the default parent or like the mental load. And so you guys take it in a different way than a lot of men take it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? And like, I'm curious, when you started making your TikToks after your daughter was born, and they were very much like, oh, I'm trying to make sure my wife gets enough sleep. And they're very, um, I don't know, like, it's just different from what we see online when it comes to dads. Was that something that you had thought about before? Or like, what came first, like you making that content and then discovering mom creators that talked a lot about these things and learning from them? Or did you like consume the content from mom creators and then think like, oh my God, I have to do better or I should be doing X, Y, and Z? Like what came first? That's a great question. I think I started sharing and then started getting a ton of attention from moms. Like my following, I think is like 92% female. Of course, um, yeah. So I think people started tagging me in things, sharing things with me. Other creators started stitching me. Um, and I think definitely the, the ego part of myself was like, oh, I'm getting attention from these people. I should, should listen to what they have to say and, and see where I can pay it back and stitch them, them back. Um, and I, probably there was a piece of it that was like me trying to understand where they're coming from. Um, and then definitely like going down the rabbit hole of what it's like to be a moment. But I think also being a part of paternity leave and being home with Alyssa for four months, um, that that was a huge eye and opener in all the things that she does. Like you recognized one of the huge triggers for her was just like a messy kitchen. It was really hard for her to like be relaxed at all. Like everything else could be a mess, but if the kitchen was a mess and the counter wasn't somewhat clear, um, that was really tough for her. So learning like small things like that during paternity leave. And even if it kind of like you've pointed out before, like if it looks on paper, like I'm doing good things, if she can hear the vacuum in the background, if she can hear dishes clanking in the sink, like she's going to feel a little bit more at ease that I'm at least doing some things. Um, but I think I also learned a little bit more about what her needs were in any given moment. Um, so coming back to your question, like I, I think I started making content about just what was happening and what I was doing. And 
started interacting with a ton of moms and they would call me out my shit all the time, which I think a like unintended piece of education that is it's hard to share is like all of the fe- the thousands of comments of feedback I've received from moms when I'm fucking up and when I'm doing things right. That if you're not a content creator, I, I can't I can't recreate that for you. I can only try to regurgitate as much as I can. Yeah, that's so funny. The feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like one of them so like one thing that I was really trying to do because I recognize like Alyssa was really struggling with sleep she, was, she went through PPD um, is having the monitor next to her in the bedroom I in a lot of ways I think I did a good job um, taking over a lot of those like night feedings like just bring the bottle to her like calming her down um, but at some points I, I really wanted to say like hey like let me take the monitor from you so mm-hmm. that you can sleep in peace. I can manage this. And <laughs> I did a TikTok trend, but didn't fully understand what it meant. And again, uh, caught a bunch of people that were misunderstanding me, but there, I was saying like, it was, it was that one where you like disappear with this like weird edit. Dun, 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 whistle, do, 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 do. And then I would disappear. And I was saying like, why won't you let me just take the monitor from you so that you can sleep? And then I got thousands of comments saying like, she's dealing with postpartum anxiety. You can't do that. Like, fuck you. Like, yeah, wait, I swear here. Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I, that was like one of those moments where I realized that the, like the, the maternal gatekeeping almost, but in a way that was like, that some moms can deal with at that point in time. I think at some point there's got to be a a point where they can hand off more of the responsibility um, and anxiety is no longer at play and it's more like just habit. Um, That, that was one of the huge ones that I, that I got a lot of negative feedback for and made some adjustments. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. We, when Milo was newborn, the sleep thing is wild. And my husband is a physician. So he didn't get a paternity leave. Like I had Milo on a Friday and my husband was back at work Monday. So how we structured the evenings so that I could sleep was I would go to bed at 6pm. He would have Milo and the monitor in the living room like doing his usual evening. And then I would sleep from 6pm till about midnight. So like a solid six hours of sleep. Milo was just getting formula at that time. And then my husband would bring him into the bedroom, like put him in the bassinet next to me in the bed. And my husband would get into bed and go to sleep. And then if Milo woke up multiple times that night, it wasn't a big deal because I've already had like a full six hours of sleep. So I was able to function then for night wakings and then the next day at the same time. It's obviously not easy for everyone to do that, especially if you're breastfeeding and they won't take a bottle or whatever it is. But it was interesting. Like for me, I was able to say like, we have to do it this way because I need to get adequate sleep. But I think what happens is a lot of moms feel uncomfortable communicating their needs to their partner and they feel like they have to take it all on themselves especially if their partner's working the next day. It's like, you can't expect your partner to do anything. Like that's often the attitude of lots of moms, I think. But then it just like snowballs and you get burnt out and people need sleep. And do you find that Alyssa is good at communicating her needs to you? Like since day one, or did it take a while for that to get better? Or I think it's taken a while. I so, I mean, she, she's dealt with, uh, anxiety and, and, um, depression before going in. So going into those, like we had multiple appointments where we we're trying to figure out like what were appropriate meds for her to be on, um, beforehand going into it. And I think it, it took at least a couple months, probably six months to get a good, um, level of like just those and mm-hmm. figuring out when she was feeling anxious, when she was feeling upset, was it the drugs? Was it the situation? Was I actually 
screwing up or was it one of those things? So um, I think the, the big learning curve for me throughout that has been learning to not take things personally and try to hope first that it's in fact one of those other things, but also be introspective and, and see if there is something that I can change to improve the situation. Um, but yeah, I think by now she's gotten really good at um, telling me what she needs. Uh, like yesterday she was sick. And um, so recently when I moved into this office, we moved the, the nursery to another room in the house. We also moved her desk, which was in the middle of the living room so she could multitask into the bedroom um, upstairs. So she advocated yesterday, like, hey, like, I know I said I was going to take over the rest of the day. She took a sick day um, and volunteered to be with it because she is still really trying to help me get into my my new role. And she's like, I, I would really, really benefit from a nap. So I took the last two hours out of my day, got let her be, got Everly outside of the house so she couldn't hear her um, and was able to get her nap. So. It's been a long journey in her communicating what she needs. That, I just want to say the fact that you brought the child outside of the house is key. Like, I always try and explain how it's very hard to relax, even if like, your partner takes over, when you can hear things going on in the house. Because, and I don't know if it's like a mom guilt thing. I, I often call it partner guilt. Like, Sometimes my if I'm having a rough day, my husband will be like, you know what, just stay downstairs, like put your show on, I'll do bath time and bedtime. But it's like, I can hear what's going on upstairs, and I can't relax. And I have this guilt eating me up feeling like I have to go help with bath time and bedtime, or like I should be there. Like I'm doing something wrong, because I'm downstairs. It's such a wild Thing. And so I always say, like, unless I'm outside of the house or they are outside of the house, it's hard to get that alone time and actually benefit from alone time or de relax, if that makes do you, sense. Do you think that the guilt comes from, like, this perception that we have around who we need to be as, like, I think we're, we've gotten on a level of like, we don't need to be perfect, but do you think it's like a, a perfection mentality that society's taught us that, that gives you that guilt? That could play into it. But I also think that when you are the person that does, and I don't consider myself the default parent by any means, like my husband it's very much 50, 50. He is on the ball with so many things. And a lot of people are surprised. Like I was just talking about, I had this whole conversation about default parenting with my friend. And I was like, I, I never registered Milo for kindergarten. I never signed him up for soccer. I don't communicate with, like I've never made a doctor's appointment or his, or his haircut appointment. Like there's certain things I'm totally hands off and he just does automatically without me even having to ask. So I don't consider myself the default parent, but there's something about taking that maternity leave for 12 months and being the primary child care person for those 12 months. And then also during COVID, I was the one at home 24-7 with Milo. Um, that I think when you are the default parent, and I think as moms too, we are just more affected emotionally. Like last night, Milo had a terrible bedtime and I'm like in tears having a hard time falling asleep because I'm just so upset about what went on and my husband is like okay like he's four like it's it's yeah. gonna be fine you know what I mean so I think what happens is as moms the example of my husband being upstairs and giving Milo the bath and me trying to relax downstairs I'm projecting how I would feel in his shoes onto him so I'm I would not enjoy being alone giving Milo a bath right now because I'm already like stressed out. I don't have any patience left, whatever it might be. But my husband is not in that situation. He's not as emotionally affected by Milo misbehaving or not listening or like noises. And like, he's not overstimulated. He was working with adults all day. You know what I mean? So I think we yeah. project it onto our partners. We're like, oh my God, like... 
he's probably struggling up there like oh it's such a big deal and to him it's not a big deal so it's like I'm projecting my own shit onto my husband thinking that he's having a hard time and he wishes that I was actually there helping him (laughs) it's funny too because like I know there have been moments where there's there's a piece of me that feels proud because I in a lot of ways I think Alyssa has been a default parent in in a good amount of our time and I think we're continuing working on getting her off default mode um, like I think getting her desk out of the living room was a huge step um, so that it's really clear who is on duty sort of for for who's with Everly when she's home instead of it defaulting to mom because her office is in the living room. Um, So one of us is probably in our offices unless I bring my computer out there. Um, But what I was going to say is that there's a lot of pride that I experience when I know she's had a tough day and I, I feel competent enough to take her off of her hands. Mm -hmm. Um, like, Like last night when she was like, I really need to go to sleep early. So I was like, yes, go. Um, and I just said, can you just set up? So our nighttime routine is we do it together. Typically, Same. um, I'm usually sitting on a closed toilet next to her while she's sitting next to the tub. Um, a lot of times I'm asking her questions, but like, I don't know how to manage long hair. So I ask, I ask things like that. Um, so like last night, I know I probably screwed up the conditioner and might've given her a couple knots, but, um, <laughs> Like I, I felt proud that I was able to to let her go be in the other room. I don't know how much she heard. Um, I totally invite her to put her white noise on, especially if she's trying to get rest. Um, but I, I wonder, I wonder how many dads, when they are able to take it off, if they feel pride in that versus like I know from watching a lot of toxic men that they they are in that space that you're kind of talking about. So you could. The projecting that you're talking about could also be all of those men commenting in, in the videos being like, screw that. I'm not, yeah. I do want help. I do want mom here. I don't want to do this. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's true because that's kind of, it's hard because you know how a lot of other people feel. I always say when I put out a TikTok that has something to do with, these like parenting topics of like oh my husband like not making pancakes on Saturday morning oh my god (laughs) yeah I like that always gets sent to the toxic men for some reason like the algorithm is like ooh, let's piss these guys off like yeah I just want to comment on that is I remember seeing that uh when that was that like last fall maybe Mm -hmm. Um, I remember seeing it and I think even I was a little triggered from that. I was a little upset at first. And then I listened to the whole podcast and I got it. Mm-hmm. And I was so glad that I, I remember someone else. I forget. I'd, I'd either, I think I do edit one of your other videos or something. And someone had commented like, Oh, I hate that. Lady. Was like, is it because of the pancake thing? And they're like, <laughs> yes. I was like, no, 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 watch the whole episode. Like you'll get it. Like when you talked about the fact that like everything looks good on paper, but in reality, what I want is some quality time together. Yeah. Like, I was so glad that I got the further clarification of that. It was, it was a great viral little item there. Yeah, I know. It's it's funny. Like, you only have so much time that you can put into a TikTok. Yeah. But context is everything. People are just like... But it's also funny, mm-hmm. like, how much that elicited emotions in people be, just because a woman didn't want her husband to make pancakes. Like if you think about what, like the actual, like, why is that a big deal? But people lose their damn minds. Yeah. And and I think, I, I feel like I've heard you speak to this really well before is like just the amount of, I think it was the podcast with Tracy was on here. Um, and like the fact that so many men are not doing that and are, I don't want to use the word deadbeat, but like are are not willing to put in that sort of effort and they do feel like it is the the mom's responsibility. Um like sometimes that there are a lot of people that just can't hear that. I think you have to have a little bit more equitable of of a partnership to be able to hear the value in what you were sharing. Mm-hmm. And 
you're in the minority of equitable partnerships. Yeah, because I think a lot of people are like, he's in the kitchen making pancakes. My husband's downstairs playing video games, you know, and it's like, well, that's not OK either. Like, that shouldn't be the comparison. Um, I was watching one of my friends. She made this video about how um, rich people don't typically actually gatekeep information. It's that they're they are rarely in the right audience that they can share it. Like there was a there's a, a billionaire something talking about how they didn't have that much money in their bank account of a million dollars and in one room they're like oh this guy's an asshole he's just flexing on us that he's got a million dollars in the bank account but there's another group that's going to hear that and like they're going to recognize oh that's right yeah he doesn't keep it in a bank account it's losing value it's it's not getting money somewhere so like there there is like a huge market for that information and TikTok is that's a very minority place that you're going to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, it's it's always those videos that they're like, let's send it to <laughs> the angriest men. <laughs> uh, OK, I heard before we started to record, you mentioned the unicorn space. I have because I know you do a lot of work with Fair Play, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, um, like equal division of labor and whatnot. I have never heard of this book. And now I feel like I need to get it and read it. But can you explain a little bit about what that book is about? Did it come out before or after Fair Play? After. So it's a, the word unicorn space is in Fair Play. Um, it's part of the card deck is like each each of the partners has a unicorn space card in their deck. Um, I actually think that unicorn space ought to be read first. So uh, if I were to boil it down, fair play is the structure for um, an equitable partnership. I'm, I'm careful to use the word equitable and not equal because um, it doesn't necessarily create equality, but equity, equanimity, equi whatever, equity. Unicorn space is talking about, uh, and I I forget if it was you, it might have been Laura Danger talking more about this, but a lot of moms like lose their identity um, that they had before being a parent. And then it just becomes being a mom, being um, a wife. Um, and so Unicorn Space is a lot of like rediscovering that for yourself. Um, like for Alyssa, it's Unicorn Space. For me, I think it's content creation and making a difference in this, um, this realm. Um, for you, it seems to be kind of similar to mine in the mom room and the podcast and, and content creation. Um, I think it's, it's like, uh, she recommends like staying away from the word hobbies because mm -hmm. hobbies, like there's not necessarily passion in, but something that you're passionate about that you care about that, um, you might sort of associate with your identity, especially like probably what you came into a relationship with beforehand. Um, I think unicorn space should come first. And I'm going to share a metaphor is that most people when they're saving for a house, um, they're like, hmm, we should save for a house. We don't have the money to buy a house yet. We should probably start a budget. A budget will help us identify how much we're saving, how much we need to save, what we need to cut back on, what differences and changes we need to make so that we can afford the house. But if someone just said, yeah, let's do a budget honey, why do we need a budget? Well, cause it's good. Okay. <laughs> sure. That, and then like the execution is probably going to fall through. I think fair play is the budget. And I think unicorn space is the house. Mm. So I think a lot of partners, uh, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to use a lot of heteronormative language and speaking to the majority of the situation here. A lot of men, um, I think probably want to pitch in more, want to, um, be a more equitable partner. They don't have a great roadmap for it as, as much as that a lot of people aren't going to be able to hear that right there. Um, but I think when they see that their, their wives, um, identities are getting lost in motherhood and being a wife and they realize, Oh, like they used to ski a lot or they used to horseback ride before met. They don't do that anymore. And you start making space for them to do those things like, okay, I, they need five hours on a Sunday. Like, how can we make that five hours happen? How can I be responsible for 
our child so that they can be out and doing those things. You start having to create the budget. You have to start creating the space and the structure for that to work. Oh, they need to be able to go to daycare and soccer. Uh, I'm throwing out dumb uh, examples, but like on Sunday, like, okay, well, then they need to have the, the soccer coach's information. They need to, um, the, all the mental load that goes along with soccer and daycare, they need to be accountable for. And so if you introduce unicorn space, you are identifying what that thing is that you want to be doing um, and making space for. It makes more sense to create a structure for that, which is the fair play method. Mm. I love that. That makes so much sense. Like if the mom wants to gain back identity, start doing things that they enjoyed before having a baby, you need to make space for it. So now how do you work together as a team so that they can go and do those things? Then the other partner has to do more around the house, obviously, and childcare tasks too. Um, yeah, I, I remember it made me think, I, I don't know if it was a TikTok, but I did something about how like so many men golf and that's their golf widows. Yeah. That's their like hobby and what they do. And they're so passionate about it. Like whatever, like some, some guy, like some of my friends, husbands, play hockey or something and that's like you know one evening a week for a couple hours but golf is like Saturday or Sunday all day and I remember listening to an episode of Armchair Expert and I feel like he was talking to Ashton Kutcher and they were saying how like my wife would never let me take up golfing like never like that's not even an option like unless it was matched with like okay every time you go golf for six hours like I'm gonna go to the spa for six hours another weekend um which I feel like a lot of the times men would be like what that's crazy like you're not going to the spa like for an entire day but they do it and it's so common and I get that it's like a hobby and you enjoy doing it but at the same time and it, it's because after a baby comes into a family, usually the men's life and their hobbies and their interests are unaffected. So they continue doing their golf stuff that they've always done. But now the mom, and usually it's because they are the primary childcare like, person, they are in recovery from labor and delivery, so they, it's so much easier for them to not do what they were interested in before or feel like they can't. Um, but yeah, the golf thing, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And at the same time, my husband and I experienced this a lot is let's say, okay, you have a baby. Obviously your life is so much busier for both of you. So much more going on, so much more responsibility. You can't just do whatever you want whenever you want. Now, if you're taking your time to do your unicorn space, like ho hobbies, interests, whatever, and I'm doing that, it's hard now to find time for us to do things together, hmm. which is like a huge struggle. I'm so busy. My husband's so busy. He's on call a lot. I have like events that I get invited to or, or things. So he has to stay home with Milo. We don't live near family. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, visiting my grandpa in the UK. This is very important. Um, but yeah, then it's hard for us to do things together. And I remember listening to a, a Jay Shetty podcast. And one of the things about, he had like six important things for couples to not fall out of love. And one of them was having new experiences together. And I was like, well, shit, like after you have a kid, it is so hard to make that happen. And I feel like it's easy to just forgo, you know, going on dates or something like, like we went to a driving range once and then went for a beer and I was like, whoa, look at us. And then did we ever do something like that again? No, like it's, 
it is. It's challenging. Anyways, that was like my rant about, you know, having hobbies and having your own time, but then also having time as a couple. It's like, where's the time in the world? Yeah. yeah. I will say one thing that's made a pretty big difference for us, which is a really specific like quality time that we're having together. But um, she took this course called Desire and Fire. My friend Amy run, runs it. Um, the pleasure mastery course. Yes, it's exactly what you think it is. Um, and, uh, we've been, I think I've heard you talk about this too, of like, um, somewhat scheduled, like intimate time. Uh Um, but a little bit more purposeful in that. So like one of the things we tried out, so this was a, like a homework assignment she had from the course was to have non-sexual sensual massage time oh i so love massage this is good so you're you're massaging that person's genitals but not in a sexual way in like a in like a there's no end in sight it's like a you set a 10 minute timer if that leads to other things great if it doesn't lead to other things great and see remember, that's the whole point you got you have to take out the stress of the outcome yeah. i've i've heard people talk about this a lot yeah. And, and it, I, I, it was funny. Cause like, I felt like I was, uh, the, my identity as like a man, like was, um, on its back one day when we had scheduled, I think we had Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something. It came Friday. I was like, I don't want to do this. Like <laughs> and, and we had had sex the, the previous two times. Like, I think we're at a hundred percent. I'm going to call it conversion rate of like yeah. it turning into that. Cause it, it's just, we both enjoy it. But like, I don't know that there's ever been a time in our relationship where I didn't want that. Um, And like, it ended up turning into that again. But like, the fact that I didn't want it, and then we both really enjoyed it when it happened, I think is a great case for um, scheduling intimate quality time that's not specifically sexual upfront. Yeah. Who was I having this conversation with? I feel like it was the people who wrote the book called Sex Talks. Yeah, I had to look at it. It's behind me. Um, Vanessa and and Xander. Anyways, they're like a married couple. They talk all about like, s- like sex in a marriage. And that was one of the things they were saying is like, there's so much pressure on couples to have sex that then you just end up doing nothing. Because mm-hmm. you, you don't even want to like, hug that person or like you know be a little like give them a kiss or anything because you're like I don't want to like I don't want to do that so if you take that pressure away and you just say like oh okay like let's just have like a romantic intimate time like no pressure then it eventually just ends up happening anyways it's so like it's it's I swear to god yeah and and something that I've been talking about more recently that um I I know it it was a, uh, it's pretty uncomfortable for me to talk about still, but I I'll say it cause I think, you know, you have a pretty good following and I wonder if this will make a difference. Um, I recognized about five, six months into Everly being born. Um, I, I knew going in, I was like, okay, Zach, just be prepared. It's going to be like a year before we have sex again. Like mm-hmm. just mentally prepare. Like I, I did my best to prepare for that. And I think it was once she was finally sleeping in a crib, I was like, okay, don't get her hopes up, Zach, but like things could change. And I forget how the conversation actually started, but I think I was, I was talking with another guy, which is pretty rare occasion that I was like sharing this vulnerability. Um, But he's like, have you ever tried just like asking to like self pleasure near her? Um, And I realized that there was a, significant amount of shame that I experienced when self-pleasuring and it was oof, bring shivers it's like gross to talk about like like jacking off like was a terrible concept that it felt like a part of like this shitty part of myself that I needed to do um and provided something but I wasn't quite sure I was assuming it was just a dopamine rush that I wanted um similar to like when you play video games and like you're just avoiding stuff um but I recognized that it was, I actually did want to be able to be intimate with her and share that part of myself. But I was so ashamed, like, I would not do it when she was in the house. I would do it when she was asleep. I would 
go into the corner of the bathroom and like do that. And I had this conversation where they were saying how much shame there was around it. And I said, how would you feel about me doing this next to you? Um, you don't have to participate. I just recognize like it's a almost like a meditative experience I'd like to have with myself. But at the same time, I'd like for you to be present so that I can like de-shame, de-stigmatize this aspect of myself sort of. Um, and I think she was uncomfortable with it at first, um, but we've actually gotten really comfortable with it. So pretty much whenever I want to have sex, I, I just recognize I want to feel intimate with her and I want to have pleasure in that area. And she doesn't need to be a part of that actually she doesn't need to play a physical aspect in that but i i enjoy her presence around it where do you think the shame for that comes from and I, i'm sure it's like so layered and like it's how we're raised and it's i know it's wild like i i bet you people are gonna listen to that and be like oh my god like my husband would never do that in front of and it's like why like why not like and it, would she do that in front of you so since she took that course, we've been we've been playing around with that idea, like doing that next to each other and like trying to not like pretty much like end up turning each other on, like sort of being with each other for it. But and then eventually it's like, OK, I can't resist anymore. And then we kind of jump on each other. But um, I think the shame I know part of it comes from. Probably a lack of education in our our childhoods. Um, I know there was definitely a specific event. I remember when I was a teenager and had just discovered um, porn on the internet. Um, I think I like, fell asleep in my mom's office watching it or something. And she came in seeing my pants down and like this video playing and she like freaked the fuck out. And I think from then on, uh, I was like, I know this is bad. I shouldn't be doing this. This is, I'm a bad person. Um, I'm a bad person for wanting this and enjoying this and like having any sort of pleasure around it. And I don't, I, I think that's still there for me, but realizing that, um, her reaction didn't necessarily have anything to do with who I am as a person. Um, and like how my brain works, that was, that was her own reaction that I don't mm -hmm. have to talk to myself. And I also think like this is such an important conversation because as parents we need to get out of that mindset and like prepare ourselves for that to happen with our children and what is our reaction going to be you know like that there has to be more of like an understanding and like an accepting space around it because it's going to happen. Like we're all humans and it's so normal and it's so, it's like a healthy thing. Like everybody's like, oh yeah, masturbating is so healthy. Like it's perfect. Like do it as much as you want. But then socially we don't act that way. You know what I mean? It's like, there's like a, a, a bias, like a, so we're told one thing, but then people react to it in a completely different way. And so we're like, oh, maybe it's not like, an okay thing to do but that's interesting that you have that memory from childhood because now that makes me think like okay how would I react in that situation and it's probably because you're just like not expecting it and you're just like oh my god like but you don't want to pass down that that thought like you don't want to pass that down to you then your kid the shame of it. yeah the shame that's yeah that's the word I'm looking for like that's so interesting. I I should have got like a sex therapist on to talk about that there's topic. A, there's a really good creator. I love the educational stuff she puts out. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but I see her face and know exact. The moment she pops on, I was like, oh, I'm going to learn something good here. Yeah. Tell me. So next time you see what, like, send it to me so I can. Yeah. I will. yeah. Um, so she talks a lot about, I think she has a daughter um, and she's like, if I can, the someone had asked her in the like the comments like what would happen if your daughter asked you to buy a sex toy and she's like i would pat myself on the fucking back that i was able to create an, enough of a safe space that they feel comfortable coming to me about it and not the sketchy teenager in their classroom like getting it on the black market or something weird <laughs> um yeah and 
and I, I love what she has to say about it. And I, <clears throat> I like premeditate all these conversations I might have with her in her teen years and later on. And I was listening to this other podcast, waving the red flag. Um, and he was talking about how a lot of dads um, have this like strange obsession with not letting their daughters have sex. And like, she's not dating until she's 21. And um, I'm looking forward to the day that I can have an evolved conversation with our daughter about that. And um, it's, what what they discovered in it was like a 45 minute back and forth they had on this podcast with their guests was that men see sex as a negative thing that happens towards women and that's why men don't want to have other boys having sex with their daughter because it's seen as a negative thing but if we can shift that to it's a positive experience for both people um then it's not something that's going to be stigmatized in that way um and as long as it's like equitably like equal and there's pleasure on both sides and it's there's consent like that that's all that is good yeah that's it's interesting because we think that we've come so far and like oh things are so different now but when you really sit and think about it there's still so much um like the way people think and how we react to things, it's still very much a part of society. It's getting better, obviously, like conversations like this and like bringing awareness to certain things and even just taking a moment to stop and think like, oh yeah, like this could happen. Like, how am I going to react as a parent? Like, I don't think past generations have really even thought much about these things um so yeah that's why that's why i love podcasting like i didn't know we were going to talk about this you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's perfect um okay so before i let you go can you tell people where they can find you online um and also do you have any advice for moms who want their partner let's say it's a husband a man to think more in the way that you think and you know be more like helpful and if they're feeling like the default parent because a lot of people ask me like how do I even approach this subject with yeah. my husband do you have any advice for moms who are listening if they want to bring it up to their partner I'm still doing market research on this sort of, but um, I have a, so first to where people can find me, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Zach Thinkshare or real Zach Thinkshare. My previous account was fished on Instagram. So it's the one with the, I felt super stupid paying $14 for the blue check mark, but um, it's actually useful to me because my previous account got fished. So I know I'm, I'm upset that Canada doesn't have that option yet they're just testing it out in the u.s right now and i was oh, like good. the fact that you have security on your account and that yeah. you can contact a support person if something happens is like so worth it yeah and just the fact that like they associate like your your license with the account is exactly huge so that, like if that were to happen again be like good you don't have my id you can't steal my account now exactly like it it should be available to everyone because if you think about it well i guess it's really important for people who like this is their life like this is their career this is how people make money like some people quit their jobs because they are an influencer on instagram and their account can just be taken away it's terrifying so yeah. i'm hoping that comes to canada because i would like the security too yeah. anywho um, yeah, so um, Instagram, real Zach Thinkshare, TikTok, Zach Thinkshare. Um, the reason I brought that up is in my stand store, which is the little link in my bio, um, there's seven fair play conversation starters. When I say I'm still in the market research stage, I don't know how well they work, but they are like a an algorithm for how I try to start a conversation when I know it's going to be kind of tough. Um, I usually have some sort of dopamine in there, so alcohol. Uh, ice cream, sort of inviting my my wife to the table, say, hey, I want to talk about something. There's this video I saw and sparked my curiosity. And I was, I was thinking about some changes I'd like to make, um, have it be at a low stress time. I know a lot of people are starting that conversation when they're in the midst of like a really emotional moment. 
terrible time to start a conversation, great opportunity to book that mark that for yourself and say, hey, I'm in a terrible space right now to talk. Please just go do that thing that I asked you to. Can we talk about this later? Like acknowledge that you're in upset. Acknowledge that if you can own your upset in that moment and take some kind of ownership in the situation, I think that's a great place to come from. I think um, I know when Alyssa's asked things of me and she's came from a place of owning something, whether it's her reaction, whether it's, um, you know, it's sort of like you had said earlier, like if she's recognizing that she's projecting something onto me, um, I know that that's a great way to open the door for having them being open to and not come to a conversation defensive. Um, so those are like some starters. And then I think if you have something specific, uh, I, I, there was this TikTok or Instagram guy that I hate that he made this video. Um, he always has a towel on his head, mo- kind of mocking his wife, but, oh. um, she's like, he did a role play saying like, could you, could you help me here, please? And he's like, with what? And she's like, with anything. And then his like captions, like she wants help, but she doesn't even know what she wants help with. Part of the reason I hate it is because I know that about myself is I have a hard time receiving that feedback. If you can be specific about like a specific thing that can be really helpful in moving the conversation forward. That's what I say all the time. Do not be general. Yeah. You need to be specific and a perfect example don't make pancakes on Saturday morning. <laughs> so if, uh, like if, if I were, if we're role playing here, I might say, um, Hey Renee, um, you know, the other day I saw this video got me thinking about like how we do dishes in the home. Um, I know now is not a good time. Like tonight after, uh, miles down, could, could we just have like a beer? I'll get, get ice cream or something. We can talk about it. Um, and, I want to talk about X, Y, and maybe Z. And so they can come to that conversation. They're not being blindsided about something new. They know what it's about. You're both feeling a little bit of the sugar high or a little alcohol. Like that definitely helps, I think. Um, and it it set it's like setting the table for, for a positive outcome. Um, so that, and then if if you can feel that defensiveness immediately when you start that, say, I recognize that I've been and try to find something you can take ownership for. I've had bad boundaries about this. I've not been communicating well about this. I've been holding this against you. Um, I think that's a great place to start. I know it's backwards in our household where I've been trying to bring fair play to the home for, and Alyssa's like, she's annoyed with me using the language of fair play in our <laughs> home. She's like, can you stop saying CP so dumb? Like, <laughs> So, so like, I know that it's backwards, but that's, um, that's where I would start. Um, and I will say one of the services that I'm working on building is, um, again, I believe unicorn space should come first, then fair play. And I can't tell you how many people have talked to this about, and it's sitting on their nightstand next to their bed, and it's going to gather dust for at least six more months before they see another video that pisses them off or they're partner pisses them off and they forget what I just said. Um, so I'm creating a, so I would call myself an accountability coach. I'm a certified fair play facilitator, um, which does not mean I'm a therapist. Um, it means that I'm qualified to have the conversation and guide you through that. Um, so what I'm doing is starting, I'm calling it a committed book forum. And for lack of a better word, it's a hardcore book club where it's not cute. You don't sit down and talk a little bit about things. I'm in your face. I'm making sure you're implementing things. You're doing homework assignments. Um, I was a teacher for eight years, so I've created curriculum before. Um, but the idea is that we'll go through unicorn space first. Um, it's looking like it's going to be a three to four month sort of program. Um, uh, if you go to my stand store and apply to the book club, um, it's a great, great place. So I'm going to be having a Zoom session soon for people that do want to start. Um, and it's really for identifying not just do you want more help in your life, but why? Like, mm-hmm. what is your unicorn space? What do you want to be executing on? Um, if you don't know yet, that's okay. But if you know you want to change, we're here to read the book together, discuss it on like a weekly basis, um, have really important intentional conversations about what you're gathering from it, 
what you're learning and what you're implementing, um, and then bring you through fair play afterwards, um, which I think fair play resonates with so many women because it's like, finally, someone hears me. And it, I would argue in the, the market that it's for, they feel really heard, but it doesn't cause useful action. Hmm. Um, it, it's like emotional appreciation for like what you're going through, but it's not necessarily going to forward your life in a better direction unless you get the guy involved. And that's why I recommend Unicorn Space first. Yeah. That's where people can find me. And if, if they're interested in having someone hold their feet to the fire around this, um, cause they're for, this is, uh, probably the, the grim picture of it is their marriages, dis- their, their partnerships disintegrating below their feet a little bit and know they need a kick in the pants. I would, I would come fill it out an application. Yeah. That's, that is a smart idea. It's like a book club, but like, this is not, this is not a joke. Like this is yeah. like, you're here to learn. And like, that is that's genius. I feel like there needs to be more book clubs that have that structure, like walking mm-hmm. you through, like, let's talk about it. Like, how are you going to implement these in your life specifically? Um, yeah, that's great. Good idea. I'll, I'll add one other thing for content creators. Uh, I am also hosting an account I call on the court accountability, um, where we put money on the line every week, uh, that you're putting out content. I'm currently putting out three videos a day on TikTok. Um, and I put in a handful on Instagram, every video that I don't post, I owe $10 to a group of people. So it's 21 posts a week. Um, and I'm in that group with a small handful of other creators where they're putting, we're putting on average $210 on the line every week. Uh, if you don't post what you said you were, you pay it to the group and it gets dispersed to the other creators. Oh my God, um, that's so funny. Yeah. So, I mean, I, again, if like, I feel like so many people come to me like, oh, I love the videos you do. I wish I could do that. Yeah, fucking can do it. Like, just start. And yeah. like, it's what I, I need in a lot of ways. Like, I wanted to take social media content creation more seriously and I needed someone holding my wallet accountable for it to work. I just started like caring less about content and it's going so much better because I used to like, I started to overthink everything and I don't have a lot of time to create content. So now I'm just doing like quicker, easier things and it's just so much better now. Like I'm actually, oh my God. And the cap cuts on TikTok. I'm sorry. Like those are the best. Like, you know, like the little like pictures. Yeah, Yeah. I love those so much. I feel like that has revitalized TikTok for me. And it's actually funny to watch all the cap cut things. I just love them. My favorite one that I haven't used yet is like, oh my God, I thought I was going to die. I just did that That one. one. It's so good. It was like POV, like you just went to Costco Costco on a Sunday. Yeah. (laughs) It's like genius. Uh, Anyways, okay, well, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. And everybody go check out his accounts and join the book club if you're struggling with those things.